So it's a privilege to introduce our uh, next to last speaker this morning. Uh, Dr. Anthony Bradley is happily here with us because it's 10 degrees in New York City uh, when he left this morning. Uh, he teaches at uh, the King's College there in New York, has earned a PhD from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, and is remarkably well published. Uh, he's published books including Liberating Black Theology, Black and Tired, The Political Economy of Liberation, Keep Your Head Up, and uh, more recently, Aliens in a Promised Land. Uh, actually, that's not quite as recent as the other two. John Rawls and Christian Social Engagement, Black Scholars in White Space, Something Seems Strange, Ending Over Criminalization and Mass Incarceration. And I think he said he, he just finished one more on the plane here. <laughs> okay, maybe that's not entirely true. But we're very happy to have our brother, Anthony Bradley, come and talk to us about how evangelicalism has undermined reformed applications of cosmic redemption to racial issues. Please welcome Anthony Bradley. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you for having me. I am uh, delighted to uh, be here. If you would join me in, in, in reading some passages from Genesis. So if you have your Bibles uh, with you, could you turn, turn there? We'll begin, we'll begin there. I just want to read a, a couple passages just to help sort of frame uh, some of the discussion points that I'm going to make. I'm going to really sit mostly in the framework of Genesis today because I believe that uh, that is probably where much of these issues uh, began and, and need to be a bit resolved, I, I would argue. So uh, we're, going, we're going to do that uh, today. Uh, before we read there, I just want to ask you to uh, uh, sort of work with me here. I'm going to I'm going to stretch. I'm going to pull apart maybe some things that you've heard before. I'm going to push in some maybe new areas for some people. So I need you to hang in there until the end. So if you're wondering what is he talking about, what's he talking about, what's, what's, what what is he doing? Okay, hold on. Okay, I promise you the nail will drop at the, at the end. If, if, so if you're not tracking, you're sitting there just like, okay, this is okay, yeah, okay, got that, got that, got that. This has nothing to do with the topic, but what are we doing? Hold on, right? <laughs> this, just bear with me. I promise that we'll uh, uh, get there. Uh, these texts that I'm going to read are, will be familiar uh, to uh, many of you just to sort of frame this. So much of the discussion about this is set within the context of God's uh, absolute uh, sovereignty over the entire uh, cosmos. And we read, of course, in Genesis chapter 1, that in the beginning, it says in verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without a form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, and as we move uh, down, as God continues to create things and declares them good, uh, we get to verse uh, 26 of Genesis. Then God said, "Let us make man in our image, our after our likeness, and let them be, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds." of the heavens and over the livestock and over all of the earth and, and over every uh, creeping thing that creeps on the, on the earth, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God he created him, male and female, he, cre he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves along the ground and create red lobster. That's not in there, but that, that's what happened as a, as, a, as a consequence, okay? And then further on, we get to, to uh, Genesis chapter 2, and as, as <clears throat> the story is recounted here for us uh, topically, we are reminded of what they what Adam and Eve were in part here uh, to do. Uh, verse 15, 
of, <clears throat> of chapter 2, the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every a tree of the garden, but, you, but of the tree of, no, of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, uh, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Then the Lord God said, the brother needs some help. Uh, it is not good for <clears throat> the man to be alone. I will make a helper uh, fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the heavens, to every beast the field, but for Adam there was no, uh, but for Adam there was no found a helper fit for him, and so the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and when he slept, took one of his ribs and closed them in its place, and the rib that the Lord God had given, sorry, had taken for the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of the man. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to, the, uh, to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. And then the story gets, as we know, a bit dark. The serpent enters into the narrative and... <clears throat> and deceives uh, Eve, Adam and Eve both eat f- uh, this uh, forbidden fruit, and then we get introduced in Genesis 3 uh, to what we uh, 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 sometimes call the fall. It's probably better to call it the transgression or the trespass uh, rather than, rather than uh, uh, the fall. But that's, that's sort of the, the, the context in which this, I believe these, these issues really do come to uh, the forefront. And why is that? Well, I, I think that, that so much of the discussion about what is it that God is up to and what is it that Christianity is about has everything to do with whether or not you believe that the redemptive narrative begins in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 or if you believe it begins in chapter 3. If you believe that the, the uh, redemptive story begins in chapters 1 and 2, the gospel then is a means of human beings to realize the experience of what their humanity was meant to do in the larger eschatological redemptive narrative. Whereas if you believe that the redemptive story be- begins with the fall in Genesis 3, This means that you are more likely to see the gospel as a means of saving us from our humanity in preparation for the eschaton. I need about five hours for the rest of this, but let me just just say this. Uh, For example, when one begins with Genesis 1 and 2, as as one uh, well-known Protestant pastor opines, uh, we could understand the gospel this way. Uh, Through the person and work of Jesus Christ, God fully accomplishes salvation for us, rescuing us from judgment for sin into fellowship with him, and then restores the creation in which we can enjoy our new life together with him forever. Uh, One theologian frames the gospel this way, that it is the good news of God's saving work in Christ and the Spirit by which the powers of sin and death are overcome and the life of the new creation is inaugurated, moving towards the eschatological glorification of the whole cosmos. Now, because the entire creation is brought into the mutiny of the human race, we see this beginning with the curses that are pronounced on on the creation in Genesis chapter 3. 
Redemption must also involve the entire creation. Michael Williams at Covenant Seminary frames it precisely that way. In a Genesis 1 and 2 framework, everything matters in God's redemptive plan. As such, every person matters to God because they bear his image. And the Holy Spirit uses the evangelism of God's people to unite men and women to Christ. The rest of the cosmos also matters to God because in the mystery of God's redemptive plan, we play a role in seeing that the entire cosmos, everything that God created, brings glory to God. Everything should bring glory to God. You want references for that? 1 Corinthians 10, 31, Colossians 3, and verse 23. So the emphasis here is God's sovereignty and mission over the entire creation. Not, God's, not simply God's mission over people, but God's redemptive mission over and, and involving everything that he made. On the other hand, when the gospel begins with Genesis 3, as a conceptual starting point, one might argue the gospel is this. The good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again, eternally triumphant over all his enemies, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe, but only permanent rejoicing. As such, because of Christ's redemptive work, argues this view, There is nothing that separates those who believe from their creator and all the benefits that he promises in him. What matters for the church and the Christian life is keeping the issues of sin and salvation front and center. John 3, 16, Ephesians 2, 8 and 10. So being human is is something that needs to be remedied in preparation for the eternal rejoicing. Personal evangelism and increasing disciples becomes an ever-increasing emphasis. This is what the church is for and is the work that the church prepares Christians to be about and to do. Culture, then, or society, the cosmos, is engaged for the sake of uniting more and more people to Christ... The main emphasis here is God's sovereignty in saving individuals for a life uh, with uh, him. Now, I begin to, if you, if you just sit with that framework read it for just a moment, right? It, this hit me one day when I was back in Atlanta, where I'm from, and I'm sitting in my parents' church. I was raised in the United Methodist Church uh, in, in the Atlanta area, and I'm listening to the music that's being sung in my parents' church, but I'm in the balcony because my mom always sits in the balcony. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, this is classic Atlanta. Uh, the women, my mom and her friends would sit in the balcony and offer commentary <laughs> on people as they, as they walked in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they would, they would sit there, and I would, I'd be sitting, you know, just because I'm sitting there, right? And it's like, oh, whoa, whoa, wow, wow, huh, look at there. Hmm, a fur. <laughs> right, yeah. <clears throat> so I was, I, was, I, was, I was pretty well, I was pretty well inter- introduced to uh, 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 some of the ways in which uh, the community, I just knew people, this, I'll just say the way. Uh, so I'm, 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 sitting, I'm sitting in the church, and I'm listening to the music. And what am I hearing? I'm, I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a thankfulness and praise to God, not simply for, for God's salvation. But I'm hearing praise and thankfulness because of God's intervention in the cosmos on their behalf. For example... Thank you, God, that we have clothes. Thank you, God, that my rent was paid. Thank you, God, that I have a house. Thank you, God, that that my children were protected. Thank you, God, right, that I was protected from violence and mayhem and all the things that could have killed me on the way to church today. 
Thank you, Lord, for your intervention in, in allowing us to even have a church. And on and on and on and on and on and on. And I, and I thought, my goodness, you know, when I'm, when I'm in evangelical context, I don't hear that. I hear, thank you, God, for saving me, for saving us, for our salvation. But I rarely hear things like, thank you, Lord, for heat. Thank you, Lord, for a kitchen with a refrigerator with food in it. And, and enough surplus to have frozen food. And if you're rich, you have a freezer in the, in the garage, right, for, that other, the, for the meat for next summer. Thank you, Lord, for not one car, but two. You don't hear stuff like that. So I, 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 begin, I begin to wonder, why is it that there's just such an emphasis on, on, on saving, uh, on, being, on being thankful for God's intervention in my own personal story, but not God's sort of intervention within the context of the entire uh, uh, cosmos? And I think it has a lot to do with whether or not you, be, you believe that the redemptive narrative begins in Genesis 3 or if it begins in Genesis 1 and 2. Where does the story of redemption start? So by way of comparison, you can put up that first slide now. I want to show you uh, what I call a Great Commission uh, a Christianity. This is... Uh, some summary notes from a book by, by Matt Rogers. And I'm not, I'm not slagging that guy off. This is probably one of, one of the, the, the better representations. But there's going to be some subtle differences here. And hopefully by the end you'll see why this, why this matters. So here's the problem that I see when, when the gospel begins, when the, sorry, when the, when the redemptive story begins in, in Genesis chapter 3, not 1 and 2. The gospel becomes the announcement of the good news of Jesus' work to restore sinful image bearers to the rightful worship of God, which is not wrong, it's not bad, right? I think it's truncated, that's the problem. The kingdom of God, then, is the rule of God demonstrated on earth among a worshiping people. So the emphasis there is that the kingdom of God really ends up being more about the people in the context of worshiping uh, within, within the framework of, of, of the church. So we're sort of back in the church again. Our redemption, then, is God's free work to free his people from, from slavery. Again, uh, we are really focused on, on saving people from their humanity in, 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 one, in one sense. Right. And we'll, we'll come back to this, but I just want to frame it this way. So this is sort of a, 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 a Genesis 3 sort of starting point on, on redemption. So you can turn to the, the next slide there, uh, Dustin. So what I'd like to offer is a perspective on redemption that begins in Genesis 1 and 2 that comes from the sort of classically uh, reformed view of God's sovereignty over the entire cosmos and God's redemptive mission and, and intention to redeem and restore and reconcile the entire cosmos through Christ back to himself. So I'm not, I don't, I'm not smart, so I steal people's stuff, right? I don't come up with my own stuff. Uh, this is from a book by Gerard Van Groningen from Creation and Consummation, Dort College Press in 1990, 1996. My students were born in 1997, 8, 9 now. I was, I was, I was uh, out to dinner with a few of them last year, and I spent part of the summer in Northern Ireland because uh, there's a, some research I'm doing there on the Presbyterian Catholic conflict. Um, and I was saying, you know, U2 is from you know Belfast, and a, a lot of their music was from the the conflict in Northern Ireland, you know, because you guys know, you know, they're also like Bono. And I actually got the question, who is that? <laughs> Doc, the gray just, the, the gray hair just started to grow. <laughs> who is Bono? I'm thinking, man. 1996, my students have no idea what, what was, was happening in that, in that year. 
Uh, but this is, this is a, a perspective that, that, that cosmic redemption begins with the creation itself. Okay? Lots of moving parts. Again, I need eight hours to explain this entire uh, uh, diagram. But let me, let me just sort of briefly go over uh, some of the key points so you can sort of see how this all ties together. So there is uh, what's called a golden cable. There's a theme that runs through the entirety of a biblical narrative from Genesis to Revelation. And this has three chords, right? Those three chords are, are the kingdom, the covenant, and, and the mediator. That is, that there is a pronouncement of God's sovereign lordship over the entire creation that runs through the narrative from Genesis to Revelation. There is God's covenanting commitment to the entirety of the cosmos, the entire uh, creation from Genesis to Revelation, his sovereign care over that, his commitment to not abandon it, to redeem it, and there's sorts of, there are lots of covenants that get pronounced along the way. And then there is there is a series, and the, the apex of this is, is, is with Jesus Christ, a series of mediators between God and his people. We see that throughout the entire narrative. So there's this golden cable, as Van Grondin calls it, that runs through the narrative. And this is formed and shaped and applied in time and history through the relationships in and among the Trinity. So God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And through this Trinitarian presence, there is a covenantal bond with the entire cosmos. Again, this superstructure, this cord of kingdom, a covenant, and, and uh, a mediator. So as God created uh, male and female, he gave them several commissions. And we read, that's why we read those passages. Uh, Van Groningen argues that, that one of those, if you see in the top right there, is the fellowship mandate. I call it the fellowship commission. You say mandate to people now, they think it's slavery. So I say commission. Like fly, butterfly, it's commission. Okay. Here was the, here, here was the fellowship mandate. That they would commune and walk with God. They would love God. They would worship God. They would adore being in the presence of God in the creation. That they would be fully satisfied with the presence of God in the creation. And that they were called to that. And, and, and part of that satisfaction, God gave them particular space called a Sabbath where they could rest and reflect on the presence of God there. Uh, there at the bottom... Uh, there was the uh, cultural mandate. I call it the cultural uh, uh, commission. And, and what do we see there? We see there as they were commissioned to, to, to rule and subdue the earth, to rule and subdue the creation, where they were, they were commissioned to um, uh, uh, be fruitful and multiply. So I, I, I do this all the time it's with my students. So I always say, just, they, 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 they get jarred when I say, hey, one day, you know, we'll be talking about something random. I'll say, hey, listen, when you guys are parenting all six or seven of your kids, I just, I, just, I just throw it in there all the time. I do it almost every single day, right? I'll say, now, hey, when you guys, guys want to sit down and, and pray and sing hymns for all eight of your kids, you need to make sure you, and they just, right? I, having kids is awesome. It's great. Amen? Amen. Right? I, I know it's America where having dogs is awesome. I live in New York, right? You see, you see people with a, with a Burberry stroller and a stupid dog. <laughs> right? I mean, think about this. This is New York. People walking around behind dogs with a plastic bag picking up dog poop. It's a dog. I'm from Atlanta, North Georgia. You know, you know what we were doing? A dog would die. <laughs> right? Get the shovel and make a small little hike back in the woods 
And that's where the dog goes, because dogs, it's a dog. <laughs> and you see, it, it, there, there's, a, there's a, 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 a recent story in South Korea right now. <clears throat> they're having, there, there's an, the, the birth rate's going down, and, and the pampering of dogs is going up. It was an uh, incredible story about a, a couple spending the entire day fluffing up their dog. Be fruitful and multiply. It's great. Sometimes people wonder, how come the church is shrinking? Because no, people aren't having enough kids. Just think about that, right? Now, with this model, it really pushes because if it's about the kingdom, the covenant mediator, and God's, and God's commissioning of his people to be fruitful and to multiply, we see that the growth and maintenance really of the church is from the family. As children are, are raised and nurtured within the context of, of a community of people who are forming and shaping them in the gospel, that's the, 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 the sort of scaffolding bedrock part of what of, of how the church advances and maintains. So what else does that mean? It means then that all of the things that God commissioned them to do in, in what, what Van Grondigan calls the cultural mandate, I again call this cultural commission, to rule and subdue the earth, that includes all the things that are, are part and partial of the creation, of the cosmos. It includes Politics and labor and commerce and, and industry and school and recreation and technology. All of that's a part of the creation. It's a part of the, the cosmos. God is sovereign over your cell phone. Right? God is sovereign and cares about the relationship between your children's dopamine and that iPad you put in front of them to keep them quiet. So, so we care about all of those things because God's redemptive story is, is a story about what happened when the, the covenantal bond was trespassed by the fall. And the fall affected all of that. Genesis 3 affected all of that, not just what happened to people, not just what happened to men and women and their offspring. The, 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 the curse was far, as the hymn writer says, right? As, as, uh, <clears throat> uh, as far as the curse falls, right? So it's, so, so it's, it's, all of, it's all of those, it's all of those things there. So when we're talking about redemption, we're talking about God's redeeming activities to everything that he created and all of the things uh, that, he, that he cares about. Uh, next slide. So in light of that, these are a couple books framing this. Uh, my favorite's going to be not just the Van Groningen book that I mentioned, but the one on the right. Uh, Michael Williams at Covenant Seminary here. Far as the curse is found, we think about the gospel then this way. The gospel is the good news of God's saving work in Christ and the spirit by which the powers of sin and death and judgment are overcome and the life of the new creation is inaugurated, moving towards the glorification of the whole cosmos, everything. Wherever Wherever the curse is found, God is also intends to, to bring that back into right alignment with his will for what he intended it to be about. The kingdom of God, then, is the reign of God dynamically active in human history through Jesus Christ over the entire cosmos, not just people, everything and so redemption is, is God's work to restore the entire creation, the entire cosmos, not just restoring, redeeming people, but everything, the, the, the fall affected. Everything, every aspect of it, every part of it. Okay. Oh, next slide.
But there's a problem. And Van Groningen has this fantastic section on, on the parasite kingdom and the devil. I, I notice a lot of sophisticated Christians don't like to talk about the devil. It's Satan, evil, right? It's, that's, that's what those, you know, that's what the Pentecostals do, right? <laughs> we're, we're educated. We read books and stuff like that. They just have wild worship, right? That's what, that's what they do. Always talk about Satan. Right? We, we don't talk about the devil. Let me tell you something. The devil's trying to kill you and your children. 1 Peter 5 8, right? I'm just Bible. Trying to kill you. He tried to kill you today. He's going to try to kill you on the way home, right? Seeks to kill and destroy. It's what he's all, it's a liar. It's Bible, right? Real. Talk about that sometime. Devil. In your house, trying to rack, trying to jack up your life. If you're a Christian, he's after you. Right? That's just a fact. But sophisticated people don't talk about the devil. Now, let me tell you something. There's something called the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's this great little document. It talks about Satan and the devil all over the place. But all these really educated people don't like to talk about the devil. Okay? <laughs> but these Westminster divines were free to talk about the devil because it's real, right? So what happened is that the parasite kingdom, the prince of the air, if you want to talk about it that way, right? The devil is, is parasitic on the creation. That the devil needs the creation to do the things the devil wants to do. He's dependent on the creation, the parasite, right? And so the, and so the, 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 the parasitic nature of the work of Satan is all over the entire cosmos. It's over all of the things that God created. So there, I got little, little parasite bug pictures up there. The other, the other picture is sort of a classic, that's a classic painting of the a temptation narrative of Jesus where he's sort of pushing the devil away, right? Jesus thought, you know, that Jesus... Right? Commission. Right? His baptism. Next thing, temptation. By whom? Not the internet. Right? The devil. And I don't know why people think, oh, I, oh, I don't know. It's, it's, the, it's the internet. I know it's the devil. It really is the devil. It's trying to kill you. Right? Trying to destroy your whole family. Trying to tear up this church. Right? Why is your church? Why is your church having problems right now? Right? Sorry to get preachy and like old school. It's the devil. <laughs> right? Because if you think if you think the devil wants your church to be great, okay, you are a fool. And you got to help your people recognize what's he up to. He's been since the beginning. He's been a liar from day one and trying to disrupt the cosmos. Okay. So the devil. And the parasitic kingdom is, is trying to destroy the cosmos. I was leading a men's uh, Bible study on our, our campus, and we were in uh, 1 John, and we were walking through that, and we came across this really awesome verse in 1 John chapter 3. And verse 8. And their eyes got really big uh, when, we, when we read this. Okay. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. All right, guys, stop sinning. You're of the devil. That's devil stuff. It's not just bad. No, it's devil. It's demonic. Stop it. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. Look, and this is, this is sort of like... The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. So I said, hey, I'm not the president of this college, but if I was the president of a Christian college, this would be in our mission statement. We are raising up men and women to partner with Jesus to destroy the devil's work. Anybody want to sign up for that? 
come join us as we prepare you to destroy with Christ the devil's work. That's what we're all about. All right, next, next slide. So what was the devil up to? Can I tell you a little story? Okay. If you want to think about I mean, one way to, to sort of understand the narrative, and I have, I've got like nine pages of stuff on this. I, I actually do. If you want to think about the black experience historically, if you want to think about it theologically, cosmologically, you cannot talk about that story without talking about the parasite kingdom and the devil working through people. The Bible talks about this, right? Working through people. And, and some of the things the devil did was, historically, right, Open people up to man-stealing and enslaving them. It's the devil's work. So we have a whole narrative of, of, of man-stealing, man-trading, selling the, tra- the transatlantic slave trade, uh, uh, sorry, a, a passage landing in the Caribbean, in South America, in the Carolinas. Uh, my family... We, our, the plantation I'm from is in Escambia County, Alabama, which is adjacent to Escambia County, Florida. And most likely, my ancestors docked in Charleston and were marched over to South Alabama. We are from the Bradley Plantation in Escambia County. We know exactly where it is because my family now owns it. Yeah, people went to college and got some money, got a job, and we bought it. Okay, so my, we, my family now owns the plantation that used to own us. So my dad grows up in South Alabama. My mom grows up in North Carolina during Jim Crow. What's happening there? Dehumanization all around, right? So slavery happens, reconstruction happens, Jim Crow happens, and then after that, we have the introduction of all sorts of social programs in the 1970s that even did more damage and destruction to the black community. Took dads out of the home, uh, told women really stupid things like, you don't need a man. Yes, you do. Right? Now, if you think, okay, you might not need a man personally, but your children do. They do. Right, and there's a. I have a. a, My office is stacked with psych data on why children need fathers. And guess what? You actually need to go to work. You need a job. There's something humanizing about about that. And so you you see this sort of narrative of 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 every at, at every point in the black experience is hacking away, hacking away at the possibility of being. What, what God could, could, could uh, uh, endow a human person to be. The parasite kingdom. Hacking at it. Every turn. Next slide. So, this is me back in my parents' church. What framework then allows me to think about getting involved in that anti-parasitic work. What framework then, then, then allows me to, to engage without having to sort of figure out how to do that, to sort of engage in this work of, of, of reconciling people together who've been in conflict, whether it was in South Africa or in uh, uh, Belfast, Northern Ireland, or in the U.S., or in Guatemala. What, 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 what is it that, that, that allows me to care about, about education and about uh, drugs and alcohol uh, uh, abuse and, and abortion and racism and, and economic policy and, and all those sorts of things where where, where the parasite kingdom's trying to destroy what God intends the creation to be about and to do, 
so that he can be glorified in it. So I submit to you that Great Commission Christianity doesn't allow you to do that. So with Great Commission Christianity, you have to figure out a way to do that. You have to sort of manufacture something. You have to say, well, it's the gospel and race, right? Or it's the, it's, it's the gospel and health care, national defense, or whatever. But this sort of cosmic redemptive Christianity, because it really is about, about the, the work of the parasite kingdom in destroying the cosmos, it is, it is an invitation for God's people to lock arms together and not only focus on, on uniting people to God through Christ, but it's also, it also invites people to be about the mission of making sure that everything in the cosmos is actually glorifying God because it belongs to him. It's almost like somebody coming up in your house with a marker and they just start going over the wall. And you're saying, no, no, you can't, you can't do that. My house, that's my house. You go to your house and mess with me. You can't come up, you can't come in my house and dirty up my walls. And I'm wondering when Christians are going to really lock arms across denominations, across whatever, and say, wait, this is God's world. We are his people, and you are not going to come up in God's creation and destroy it. Nope, not going to let that happen. Uh-uh. No, we're, we're, we are going to, we are going to with, with all of the resources that God gives us, we're going to fight against the, 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 the existence of the parasite kingdom, as far as the curse is found, that's where we're going. We're going to be salt and light, right? We're, we're, that's, that's what we are going to do uh, because we are God's people. Okay, next slide. So uh, my contention is that the sort of racial issues are not, uh, simply issues of the Great Commission, but they're also mainly issues of the cosmic redemptive story. It's so much more than the church. It is everything that, that the enemy is seeking to destroy, people, places, and things. He's trying to wreak havoc everywhere. Next slide. So cosmic redemption doesn't ask, is blank a gospel issue? You don't have to. You don't have to do that. Because wherever, wherever the, 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 the devil's at work, wherever you see the parasite kingdom at work, that's exactly what, what God's people care about. And we use various means to address those issues and care about those issues. The church as an institution sends people out into this great work. We form and shape people spiritually. We, we unite people to, to Christ. There is the means of grace that restores them to be the kind of people that God intends to be advocates for Christ and his mission in, 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 in the world. Because... There's a mystery. We don't know how this is all going to play out exactly, but there is, there is sort of this, this uh, uh, mysterious end, eschaton, telos, that's coming. And in the meantime, God has us busy at, at being the people in his world that is sort of pushing back the parasite kingdom, wherever it is, so that any space that we're in brings glory to God. So here's where I, why I think this matters on this discussion uh, in terms of building bridges on issues of race. I fundamentally believe that if Christians began to work together to... to have some solidarity on pushing back 
the parasite kingdom, a lot of these issues will be taken care of. If we're all caring about the sorts of issues that are destroying people's lives, right? Think about that list. Abortion, pornography, alcohol abuse, the opioid crisis, racism, sexism, wherever the curse is found, we lock arms as God's people and we fight those things by his grace and mercy together. And then we show the world what this looks like. Last point and then I'm done. The most racially diverse church I've ever seen in my life was uh, in uh, South Philadelphia. That was an Orthodox Presbyterian church. And I went there um, uh, one Sunday because I was, I was in school there. I used to go around churches. So I walk in this church and I see this. I'm looking around. And I'm thinking, what is happening here? Literally, it was, it was across race and class. So some people, some people had pretty teeth. Some people had only a few <laughs> teeth. Okay. The pastor was uh, a really pale white guy with uh, brown, and I mean, I mean brown, brown trousers polyester trousers, a white shirt, cut off, that kind of shirt with like a tie, okay? Uh, music's not really awesome. I'm just being honest. But what, you, what I saw in that church was, um, was like the greatest mix of Christians I'd ever seen. I thought, I, I thought it was at a hip-hop concert or something like that. It was so mixed. I was like, what is this? And, and one of the things I noticed about that church, because I was really curious is that the reason that church was so diverse is that the, the, the deacons and the elders and the pastors in that church were actually actively involved in addressing issues of the neighborhood. It was that simple. It wasn't the preaching. It definitely was not the music. <laughs> it wasn't the worship style. It wasn't coming together to have a little kumbaya our reconciliation Sunday, let's sing some songs together. You do the black church. It wasn't any of that kind of stuff. It wasn't none of that stuff. It was the fact that, that, that the deacons and the elders and the pastor were actively involved in, 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 in making it known that the kingdom is here. And the church is present as a place to bear witness to the fact that the kingdom is here. And people from the neighborhood were coming into this church because God was blessing them through the love that the pastor and the elders and the deacons showed in the community. It is not rocket science. It's not that simple. Jesus made this really, really simple, I thought, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so my contentions, my brothers and sisters, is if we got back to the business of neighbor loving, we got back to the business of caring about the, the advancing of the parasitic kingdom and, and locked arms to fight that together under the banner of Christ, we wouldn't need conferences like this anymore.